we don't have an army. We, we, we are too few to have an army. <laughs> so probably if we go to a war, we will be easily defeated. So this is kind of our army. Welcome to Iceland, a tiny Nordic nation best known for Björk, the Panama Papers, and a haunting lunar landscape selected by the Game of Thrones producers to be the home for the wildings beyond the wall. Just 325,000 people live on this actively volcanic island stranded in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, a number give or take around the same size as Corpus Christi, Texas. From a footballing perspective, Iceland's always been a backwater. The team has always been a guaranteed three points for all opponents. But over the past four years, all that's changed. Iceland has soared in a footballing revolution from number 131 in the world to as high as number 23. They're young and they play without fear. And now, at Euro 2016, they've become the smallest country ever to compete at a major international tournament. I came to Reykjavik to meet the managers, players and fans who made it happen here and found out how the bloody hell they did it. Fifteen years ago, I, I didn't believe that I, I would ever see Tiny Iceland go to the finals. I think that's a little bit a part of our uh, Viking mentality from the old ages. And perhaps the fact that we are a little bit crazy, you know, we think we can do everything and we just go for it. We can pass it around. We can defend as a team. And we can score goals. Iceland's population might be just one one thousandth of the United States, yet its national team have shocked traditional powers like the Netherlands, Turkey and the Czech Republic to earn its place at Euro 2016. The nation's transformation into Europe's hottest footballing micropower, though, is a recent phenomenon. Eika og Jafna. En Danin á strax fóta með til látrup. Leikur fram, leikur á Íslendinga 2. Og þrjum skot í blá hátti 2-0. Take me back to the dark years of Icelandic football, when Iceland were 131st in the world. We had uh, quite a bad spell for uh, like uh, eight years. Some would say 80 years. We really only had good condition for football in the summer, on the natural grass in the summertime. Five months, maybe. I went to training at times on kind of uh, stone pitches, if you can put it like that. It was just like little rocks instead of grass, and that's where we train. Many of the pitches that they play on in Iceland are in very bad shape, so uh, it's a tough winter. Iceland finally realised it had a weather problem. Good soccer players don't become great training on ice and gravel for seven months a year. So the country started building giant training centres, or as they call them, soccer houses, across the nation. This country, windswept, freezing. I mean, it's very hard to go outside and kick a ball. Yeah. Take us back to the thinking that led you guys to create this. I think the, uh, you know, the, the, when the artificial pitches became uh, normal abroad, you know, people started thinking, we have to do this at home. So the FI sat down and then the ball really started to roll and, and the first, uh, first hole like this came in the year 2000. And since then, there have been more and more and more artificial pitches and, and the facilities are getting better. Even the smallest fishing village has access to an astroturf field. We have a town of 7,000 people. They have their own hole, huge hole full-size indoor hall with 7,000 people. Like this? Yeah, like this, yeah. Since 2000, Iceland has erected seven giant indoor facilities, all publicly funded. They've also built over 150 outdoor fields with underground heating. And the nation has become a hotbed for developing elite football talent. I was playing handball a lot during the winter time because it was it was snowing a lot in in my hometown. The indoor hall, when, when that got built, it sort of sparkled my my uh, enthusiasm on football. And it's changed a lot, obviously, 
for us as, as, as a country because you can, you can play on, on a beautiful indoor artificial grass all year round. Having built a network of peerless facilities, the country then made an unprecedented investment into football education, building a battalion of elite coaches. You've got a master's degree in international relations. What made you decide, you know what, I'm going to be a football coach? Got lucky, really. <laughs> it's uh, typical for Icelandic coaches to have, you know, different backgrounds. And uh, then you just start coaching and one thing leads to another and for some of us it turns out, you know, very well. And you end up as a professional footballer, finally. <laughs> By 2016, this nation of 325,000 had developed over 600 elite coaches, or one per 550 people. England, by comparison, has one for every 11,000 of its inhabitants. That helps them to love the game. And what do you do when you love the game? You go outside of the organist training session and you do something extra. That's where the best players are born. Among their hundreds of freshly minted coaches, the Icelandic national team chose this man to help make it a footballing power. Some, some coaches do golf, uh, some coaches, you know, go out shooting reindeers or whatever they do in their spare time. I'm a dentist. I've been here now for four years. Started with the youth, then five years with the women, five years with the men's team, and now four years with the national team. So uh, somebody is holding my hand slowly and, and I always get more and more responsibility in coaching. I think being a dentist is really good because you have to see if the patient is scared, it's a, maybe a scared kid, and you have to approach this person differently than another one. And I think also that helps when you come to football because it's the same about players. I've always wondered while I've been sat in the chair what is going through the mind of my dentist. For you, you were probably trying to work out how to unpick the Dutch back foot. Exactly. <laughs> Jaime had help. The Federation also hired the veteran Lars Lagerbeck, who previously overseen the national teams of both Sweden and Nigeria. Your co-coaching arrangement with Heyman, it's very unorthodox, but the results show clearly worked. Yeah. I think it's the many benefits of it, but, uh, but for me it's more a formality, because the way Heyman and I is working is about the same as we did the first two years. So. I, I always believe that it's a, it's a teamwork from, from all of the staff, but especially from, from uh, the two coaches. You can't work without the good staff, in my opinion. We're lucky that we had such a, a lot of players, same age, that went together. They pushed each other always to, to go higher, play for better teams. When we take the field, we, we think if we prepare well, we can almost beat anyone. We actually have one big star. Gilvi Seussen is a star. No question about it. He is He's the heart of the team. Gilvi, He plays in the midfield for us. He, he can control the, the tempo of the games. You can always give the ball to him. He doesn't miss the ball. She takes all our set pieces, so he's, he's definitely one of the key players. The spirit in this Icelandic team, I've never seen anything like it. Is it because you guys came through as kids together, essentially playing with a bunch of your mates? Yeah, it is. Uh, a lot of the players have been playing together since we were playing in the under-16s. Um, so we've been playing together for almost 10 years now. It is such a small country. A lot of us are really good mates. One of his best mates is Aaron Gunnarsson, the squad's bearded, swashbuckling captain. I'm a bit different than the other, the other players. I, uh, like I said, I'm not the, the technical person in the team. He's a tough guy. He's the guy who tackles. He's a guy who fights. He's a guy who runs his lungs out every time. I think he could have been a professional sportsman in any sport because he has this Viking element. If we speak to any coach who have had an Icelandic player in a foreign country, he's always going to say he's a hard worker. We always think we're the best country in the world and we always think we're the biggest. And that's how it is and that's how it's always going to be. And this is what struck me most about the Icelandic people. Over and over, I was blown away by their unshakable commitment and will to succeed. They even have a word for it. Dúlegur. Dúlegur. Yeah. Dúlegur. Industrious. Say it for me. Dúlegur. My Icelandic is crap. You've got to excuse me. <laughs> Dúlegur. 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 Dúlegur, yeah. Dúlegur. When you do something which... Uh, which you're not 
should maybe be able to do, you get for Dulu. Dulu, it's just hard working. Can you say it for me? Dulu. By 2014, the strategic elements were all in place. As they coalesced, one final factor emerged, a fanatical fan base that sprung up to propel the team on its fairy tale run to Euro 2016. What has been fantastic about this group is that they have changed the others around them. So they started to wear the national team shirt and they are singing the national anthem, which is not the most powerful national anthem in the world. Before home games, Hemir Hatlgrim, a national team coach, he goes to a bar where the fans are warming up and he shows them the starting 11 even before the press gets it. I know it's silly and it looks silly for probably everyone to do it. It's our duty to let our best supporters know what we're trying to achieve in the, in the game. Now it's just this stuff, probably three, four, five hundred people in a, in a pub and they're squeezing in and it's closed and it's, it's fantastic atmosphere there. 27,000 Icelanders, more than 8% of the total population, have travelled to France for Euro 2016. Even for a famously taciturn people, emotions are now running high. It's a big moment for Iceland. It's a big moment for the players. It's a big moment for me. There was always a saying that Icelanders have too few people to qualify for a major tournament in national team football. But now we, we cannot say it. Ever. You only need 11 players. And you can create good 11 players anywhere in the world. You can beat anyone. Big Pete, I got one question. Yeah. How are Iceland going to do in the Euros? Iceland are going to win the Euros. Oh, big hey. Pete. <laughs> you make me believe in Vikings. Yes. And we are going to invade the mainland of Europe. The biggest Viking invasion since the 11th century. 